we've known for a very long time that he really didn't discover anything. I don't believe that he made any contributions to this country or the Caribbean region. Even these figures which celebrate people, these figures often have very violent histories. Um, and so I often think of monuments as being like somehow inherently violent. The statue of Christopher Columbus in front of Government House was erected in 1830 by then Governor of the Bahamas, Lord Carmichael Smith. A vocal abolitionist, the governor often found himself at odds with powerful white Bahamians and members of the local legislature. Nevertheless, his more humanitarian approach to governance garnered praise from the likes of black Bahamians and other opponents of slavery, so much so that a group of local people of color raised a sizable financial sum and gifted it to Carmichael for the commissioning of an honorary statue of his choosing. Why he decided to depict Christopher Columbus is unclear to this day. What is clear, however, is that the history of the statue is rich and nuanced, but it is also a history steeped in colonialism, imperialism, and white supremacy. Its erection may have empowered certain Bahamians some 200 years ago, but has that sentiment survived two whole centuries? What do the Bahamians of today have to say? Let's find out. So would you mind telling us more about yourself? Um, so I am Dr. Annie Lenton. I teach Caribbean history at the University of the Bahamas. Um, I, my current research focuses on incarceration in the Bahamas and the intersectionality of class, race, and gender and incarceration. My name is Jody Menes. I am a visual artist. I am an art writer and a contemporary Bahamian art curator. Hi, my name is Sonia Farmer, and I'm a writer, artist, and publisher. I am the founder of Poinciana Paper Press, which is a um, small press, independent press, dedicated to diversifying voices in Caribbean literature and art. So my name is Nisino Thompson, and I am a senior um, at the University of the Bahamas, and I'm double majoring in both history and psychology. Um, yeah, and I can't wait to be done. With this documentary or your degree? <laughs> <laughs> With the degree is... Hi, my name is Jenna Chaplin. I'm an artist and landscape architect here in Nassau. I think that a monument solidifies a person's legacy. It uh, impacts in a way in which it can either empower a group of people or it can disengage a group of people. I think that it is a constant reminder of the person and their legacy. I also think that it has a place in social hierarchy as well in the context of history um, because some people have monuments and statues and some people don't. Um, and I also think that um, it's just a physical manifestation of the reminder of the importance, importance of a person's um, place in history and time. Well, I think monuments are commemorative tributes to something or someone. I think that's what I would say safely, like if there was like a Webster Dictionary kind of definition. Um, so the impact of monuments though is I think like it records a certain like event or person in a specific place, so specific to that place. Like I feel like a, a statue or a monument uh, reflects in one part like mindset because it's something that you see on a very regular basis so there is some symbolic element to a statue to a symbol to a monument and I, I feel like it depends on what people are erecting the statue for there are some people who would do it for historic purposes some people who do it for artistic purposes but ultimately it's to I think make people feel something that or, or think of something that has existed or might exist again in the future. Statues symbolize, I guess, the past, maybe even the present, and maybe even the future um, um, uh, of a group of people. I think um, statues really are symbols of power. Um, they're mostly built, mostly built for powerful people or to represent, you know, powerful ideas. And it's those those things that we kind of represent in those physical spaces in the space of a statue itself that I think really, really tell you the stories of a culture, the stories of a, of a society. It's a part of the cultural history. And so if we're thinking about what statues really mean 
in this case, we're talking about the statue of Christopher Columbus. That's symbolic of, quote-unquote, when the, when the new world was discovered. And that narrative, I think, is very dangerous because um, we've known for a very long time that he really didn't discover anything. Well, you know, human beings have been making those types of statues and statuettes for a very long time. I believe the first statue was made 40,000 years ago. It was a small statuette that was found in Germany. Uh, and it dates back from 40,000 years ago. So as humans, we've been making such artifacts for a very long time. So the question is, why do we make such artifacts? And um, I believe we made these artifacts because we see ourselves in them, right? So not just to make them, but it's, it's, it's also about us and who we are and seeing ourselves in those various artifacts, or so in this case, um, statues. I mean, well, contemporarily, it, it's mainly for tourists. Tourists? Tourists. I believe that the Columbus Monument in front of Government House serves tourists. Simply because I feel like those are the people that give it the most attention on a regular basis. I see it more as a tourist attraction rather than um, something for Bahamian people to engage with in a critical way. I do believe that uh, the initial intent of the sculpture or the statue um, is not known clearly to Bahamian people, so I can't necessarily say that it's for us, but I do think that as it presently stands, it's more so for a tourist attraction for people who come to that. Loki, because when you, when you pull up, like, I, I've driven past there and I've seen the taxi cabs being like, oh, this is Christopher Columbus statue in front of Government House. So I think first and foremost, like, if it wasn't such a big tourist attraction, I think that's the that's the first and foremost thing because that's what a lot of people on tours are seeing. Um, but secondly, I think it goes probably towards the past systems pre-independence that helped establish and set up the country. Because again, even though they may not be from Columbus time, they still are colonial controllers of the country. And seeing something like Columbus to them probably has this almost like a warm feeling that like you know we did similar. The fact that this statue is placed at Government House um, is a clear symbol you know, of the persistence of, of colonialism um, and, and it should be removed as a result. There is something like very interesting to me about this statue being positioned where it is, um, apart from its history, which I know about how it came about, but it's like positionality sort of on top of this ridge looking out over the ocean, um, I, I think a lot about what it means like for statues to look um, back at us. Like we look at statues, but what ha like how is the statue's gaze also important when we think about the statue or the monument? Like what does it say when something is large in scale, right? And Columbus, I, I guess I can't say if he's too scale, but you know, he's like, yeah, he's, you know, a little bit bigger. I guess that Columbus would be, who knows, <laughs> what, what was his height, I don't know. But his position sort of at the top of this ridge, I think, says something. Um, and I think what it says is oppressive. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's oppressive and it's like about ownership in that gaze and in that position. We're pitting Columbus in a place of adoration of association with with a building that we consider a building of power and of influence and then we're going to put the statue of somebody who, who I don't believe we should aspire to right in front of that. So I feel there's a conflict between like where we are as a culture, what we should be supporting and, and encouraging and what that statue represents. You're looking at um, whiteness versus blackness and, 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 and how they juxtapose each other and and, and what that means and I think when you look at it contemporarily because they're situated in in the downtown area Bahamians mostly work in that that area we don't own anything which I think speaks volumes to the kind of, uh, of, of, of I guess gaze we're setting up I think we're playing right into the white gaze if you will um, the white or, or the ontological whiteness 
um, that, that we know is prevalent in the Bahamas. What it's really doing is, um, is, is just forcing Columbus and the monarchy in the Bahamas. I mean, technically the royal family of the UK is the royal family of the Bahamas. And, you know, it's saying that these people, this royalty, this monarchy supports Columbus. It supports that legacy, that legacy of colonialism. It ties in that history of Europeans coming to quote unquote the new world and taking over and really, you know, enforcing their will, their culture, their ideas on this space, on this place, on the people they found here and the people they brought here. When you look at that, both the Christopher Columbus statues and the Queen Victoria statue sitting in what is supposed to be the seat of governance um, in, a, in a black majority country, that speaks volumes to, um, to how whiteness is centered within that space. I would not repurpose the statue. I do not believe in physical monuments that are direct figurative representations of a person. I believe that if there has to be some sort of uh, momentum or some sort of physical manifestation of a person's legacy or we want to commemorate the life and legacy of a person in a certain way, I believe that it should be as abstract as possible um, because People are multifaceted human beings, and you'll always have instances where a person can do good and they do bad, but I think that to commemorate something should leave space for all of that, and I don't think that actual figurative representations of a person leave space for that, if that makes sense. Due to the history of the statue, um, I think it is probably worth maybe keeping it um, but like recontextualizing it in, um, you know, a nat national museum of some sort, right? Uh, where we can actually engage with the history of how it came about and also properly contextualize the history of Columbus. Because I think like the main thing that has to happen is like we have to move past this like narrative of Christopher Columbus in this country um, as being like a founder of some sort. I think we should leave this to the artists of the Bahamas to um, brainstorm and uh, come with, with something, come up with something, yeah. I believe that Columbus's statue should be placed in a space like uh, Collins House, which is off of Shirley Street. Um, it's a loyalist house, it's a colonial building. Um, and I think if you open it up to the public, at least it places the sculpture um, in a less reverent place and it also gives people an opportunity to still engage with it but in less of a, uh, a in a pedestal like way um, and I think it also reinforces what it is now as a tourist attraction let it be a tourist attraction but also um, let it be a tourist attraction with the proper context of who Columbus was and what he did um, to the people who did occupy the Bahamas before he came here. I would like to see it in certain ways. Um, I'm part of that group of made coffee to be thrown in the ocean. <laughs> um, because in the Caribbean, um, the sea is important. It holds history. I mean, we've had Caribbean scholars such as you Derek know, Derek Walcott talked about the sea's history, or Brathaway, say, you, the unity of submarine, talking about how the ocean and its importance to, you know, the movement of people across the region to the very identity that we hold here, you know, and you know, and the sea itself um, being able to transform things that were once bad into something good, you know, being able to reconquest I guess history to change it into something that can be um, much more, I guess, representative of people who live in these spaces. I would rather us focus our eyes towards something that's that's relevant to the world we're living in now, something that we don't want to encourage anymore, which is what I think Columbus stands for, those things that we didn't want to in this whole system. Uh, personally, I would be very interested to see a monument dedicated to the Lucayan people, like indigenous people of the Caribbean. I think that it would be good to give that space to that um, because it's time to really rethink that history through a different lens. And I would be very interested in that monument engaging with 
the history of Lucayans or the history of monuments in like a very abstract way, you know, not just like a depiction of an indigenous person of the Caribbean, but um, something that engaged with the history in a way that felt like fresh and appropriate and contemporary and arresting and worthy of, you know, turning the lens around in that history. What I would like to personally see is more sculpture being created in general because I think um, there isn't a ton of public sculpture here. Yes, there are the, the many, or the many, the several sculptures in the roundabouts of Bahamian symbols, which are great and they're, I wish, I wish we had the crawfish still that we used to sit at the bottom of the PI bridge. Um, so I think, like, yeah, I'd love to see more of it. So it's not, I'm not so much a fan of getting rid of something to just get rid of it. I would rather, I, I, I want to see more. So if an artist was to put effort into creating something new, I'd really love to see that versus repurposing something. I do not wish to see any other person um, occupying that space because I, I am of the belief that Columbus is a representation of white supremacy. He's a representation of colonialism and a very dark history of colonialism and genocide. And I think when you move him and his physical representation from that space, we also have to do the process of speaking about colonialization and why that was harmful for um, uh, Bahamian people and indigenous Bahamian people as well. I think that we also have to rectify within ourselves our need to occupy spaces that were traditionally white supremacist um, and how we don't necessarily decolonialize those spaces. So I want the statue to be removed and not replaced as a testament to us wanting to decolonize the space and understanding that we do not have to uh, move into space, colonial spaces and we don't have to inherit those ideas, we don't have to emulate those same things and those same traits in order for us to have a certain level of importance within ourselves and within the people who we look up to or the people who we believe should be in that place. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, the best thing uh, to do is. I, I truly I agree with um, Jody Menes in the sense that uh, removing it and replacing it with something else is not going to do anything, right? It's not going to solve the problem, it's not going to educate people, right, about the history of, of this country. Um, so it's not a solution. I think what, what, what centering the story of the Bahamas on the first people who, who, who lived in these islands, um, that gives a sense of, you know, of how forces, you know, from the outside can shape and destroy cultures that have existed, you know, the dangers of, of not owning your narrative, of not knowing who you are, of not allowing um, you or your, or your countryside as a person to actually grow and mature. And it's, I think that that would give us a sense of the dangers of what we face now when it comes to um, not only colonialism or post-colonialism, but also neo-colonialism and how that's affecting how our country develops. It's developing our idea of culture, idea of what it means to be Bahamian. You know, the, sometimes the petty things we fight over, they, they, the, you know, the identity markers we use that don't really make sense. Or when you talk about the complex histories that exist in the islands, I mean, the Bahamas is more than the province. It is more than that. So it is more than, you know, than just, you know, saying the words buddy or eating kong salad or going and jumping. You know. It is this whole complex of people who have moved across this archipelago from any part of the world, any part of the region and the way we treat people who live in this space. So it's really much, I think, about reclaiming our sense of identity. And if we start there at the beginning of the first people who live, who knew how to work the land in a much more um, sustainable way, I think we can find ways to actually free ourselves in a certain way from the bonds of colonialism. I, I still believe like certain values and morals transcend time transcend like any age that they were in. So when Columbus came, the way that he did what he did caused a lot of damage, a lot of irreversible damage. Having this discussion about why it needs to come down um, and what it continues to represent, um, I think especially for a, a, a country like the Bahamas, which is I think about 90% um, people of color, 
um, or Afro Bahamians, like this is an important moment I think in history, Bahamian history, and we need to really take this moment to to reevaluate, to reexamine, um, and to reimagine the space that we call the Bahamas. I think it's the mindset that has to change, right? If your mindset is the mindset of the colonizer, then nothing is ever going to change, right? Because we have bright people in the government, right? We have bright people in academia here. There are bright people on this island. Um, but the mindset needs to change. Um, if you keep exploiting the, the population, right, as the colonizers used to, then nothing is ever going to change. So you need yourself, right, to make a break um, as a leader, right, uh, to make a break, a clear break from, from the colonial era. It's never a right time or the best time to make these decisions. It's always bigger things or bigger issues to display at hand. There are always issues more prevalent to, like, you know, to discuss or to um, deal with. But the question I always ask is, where's the best time? You know, 20 years ago, they thought that I was in a good time. 40 years ago, they thought that I was in a good time. We have bigger issues to deal with. 60 years from now, you think, you know what, we have bigger issues. Let's not really more than then. When will be the best time to do it? There's never a good time to eradicate these symbols in the country. I think it was Oprah or Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou, I think, or uh, well, one of them, I think she was on the show. But she was saying, when, um, when you know better, you do better. We know better now, and I think we just need to do it. What I am interested in is the space that is created when we take it away. Because there then is the actual silence and the space for something new to happen. And I want that something new to be in a Bahamian's voice through their craft, whatever it is, right? Because we have to see ourselves as protagonists in this space, right? That is powerful. Thank you.